Good morning on this Sunday, August 21st, and welcome to the Georgia Gang. The former mayor of New York City and Trump attorney Rudy Giuliani goes before a special grand jury in Fulton County. Also, Democrat Stacey Abrams says she knows the group of voters she needs to win against incumbent Governor Brian Kemp. And leaders at the CDC announce a major shakeup after they admit they fell short during the COVID-19 pandemic. Belita, Phil, Farron, and Janelle are all here. The debate and discussion begin right now. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia Gang starts now. Rudy Giuliani arrived in Atlanta on Wednesday. He testified before a special grand jury that is investigating attempts by former President Donald Trump and others to overturn his 2020 election loss in Georgia. I'll talk about this until it's over. It's a grand jury and grand juries, as I recall, a secret. <laughs> the attorney for former President Donald Trump was tight lipped as he entered the Fulton County Courthouse. It's unclear how much Rudy Giuliani was willing to say before the special grand jury now that his lawyers have been informed he's a target of the investigation. Special grand jury proceedings are secret. The questioning takes place behind closed doors. Former President Trump has denied any wrongdoing. In seeking Giuliani's testimony, Fulton DA Fonnie Willis noted that he was both a personal attorney for Trump and a lead attorney for his 2020 campaign. She recalled in a petition how Giuliani and others appeared at a state Senate committee meeting in late 2020 and presented a video that Giuliani said showed election workers producing suitcases of unlawful ballots from unknown sources outside the view of election poll watchers. The claims of fraud were debunked by Georgia election officials within 24 hours. Other allies of Mr. Trump have also been swept up in the probe. South Carolina's Lindsey Graham is appealing the judge's decision that says he must testify before the special grand jury. Theron, to you first, Giuliani was behind closed doors for about six hours. We don't really know what was said. Well, it was funny, before the show, Janelle and I were talking about Vernon Jones was there to accompany <laughs> his good friend, uh, Giuliani, uh, Rudy Giuliani, who came to town. Lori, look, I would say this. I'm sort of tired of talking about it, however, I do think that, look, we got to know what was the role that Rudy Giuliani played after Donald Trump was defeated in Georgia. What's at question here is a call that he allegedly made to Speaker Ralston and maybe to others after the election was over. And then we know that he really put together a major scene at the Capitol doing those committees that you did a really good job of showing in your package. And many Democrats pushed back on this. And then I'm so glad you said this is that within 24 hours, after the investigation was basically investigated and the, the claims that he made, uh, it was debunked. So now I think that, look, Judge McBurney and others have come back and said that, look, you got up here, he did that. And we won't really know all the details of this legal case because it's a special grand jury it's behind closed doors. But ultimately, I do think that, listen, if you've been subpoenaed, if there's major questions, and if he's a target, I'm glad he showed up. Phil. Well, I think he, uh, the leaks are that he took the Fifth Amendment on some things, rightly so. Uh, I think he had every right to come to a legislative hearing and say whatever he want, right or wrong. I mean, a lot of people, Democrats, Republicans, whoever does this. I think that Judge McBurney, the Fulton County Superior Court judge, was very clear and said, uh, and he slapped down uh, D.A. Fonnie Willis when it came to Lieutenant Governor candidate Burt Jones. This is getting very close to the election. There will be no indictments before the, uh, the election. And... Uh, um, this special grand jury can't do any indictments. It's a political witch hunt by Fonnie Willis. She's expanded way beyond her original scope. She's now attacking the governor. I know we'll be going, we'll be talking about that in a minute. But this is political posturing. Let's talk about that because meanwhile, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp filed a 121-page motion Wednesday to kill the subpoena issued to him by the Fulton County Special Purpose Grand Jury. The governor's office says he's been trying to give a full accounting of his very limited role in the issues for the past year and now we're weeks away from the November election. Melita. Well, we wouldn't know how far the, the relationship between the governor's office and the DA's office had deteriorated, except for the fact that so many of those communications were included in this 121 page motion to quash the subpoena, which is a bit long for a motion of that sort. But we certainly saw fiery language from Fannie Willis and she did not like being disrespected. In her words, the email you sent is offensive and beneath an officer of the court, you are both wrong and confused. Let's discuss the ways you are wrong. And then she listed them. 
I, I think that, um, you know, the governor's staff can't complain about leaks when they're the ones who really leaked so much information in this long filing. Janelle. Okay, so I think the entire thing is a huge distraction. And I say that because distractions hurt Republicans because it causes infighting that's unnecessary. And we are under 80, 80 days, I believe, before the uh, midterm. My frustration with this is that I don't think Governor Kemp has anything to do with any of this right now. I think what she's really coming after is President Trump, and I think she's coming after President Trump and the, those who were closest to him. Governor Kemp, I don't, I don't even think President Trump was speaking to Governor Kemp at this time. Um, and, and, and when I look at this, and what I mean when I say distraction, I'm gonna get back to that, is that what they're trying to do is to divide and further divide the Republican base. Governor Kemp is winning when it comes to, Demo he's pulling Democrats, he's pulling the middle, he's pulling the undecided, and so now what they're trying to do is pull him in and tie him to something with President Trump and have him say something that's gonna somehow upset those who are heavy Trump supporters. And that is what this is all about. It is, a, I do believe it's a political witch hunt. I don't see the outcome becoming anything that's gonna actually benefit um, the party or benefit this state. We need to be focusing on the midterms. Melita, to that, why why Governor Kemp? Because, right. you know, he did didn't buy into Trump's claims. He didn't hold a special legislative session. Right. But there is an admission that President Trump called Governor Kemp. We do not know what the context of those conversations was, what was said, because there's not been a tape recording of that conversation which has become public knowledge. So that is the part of this story which Fonnie Willis in her investigation is trying to get to. Phil? The point of this special grand jury investigation, supposedly at the beginning, was to just find out if there was interference in the 2020 election. I can't see how you can argue that Governor Brian Kemp was trying to interfere with that election. Well, I'm not saying that he was. What I'm saying but that's the is point that of the he grand had jury. a conversation with the president and the grand jury has a right to know the context of that con conversation, the substance of that conversation, and that is what Fonnie Willis is compelling. So it's a fishing help. expedition. I, I, it's a I, fishing I wouldn't expedition. say that, that we have the right to know about his conversations. We have the right to know if it was something that was said that was wrong. And I, what we do know is that Governor Kemp was not in support of the, of, uh, he wasn't pushing the whole election fraud. So, I mean, so to, to my point, to just say that because the president called a governor that we have to know what they talked about, that, that's, not, that's not true. We don't well, we have to know, know anything. what they talked about until he testifies. All right, let's move on to this issue because it's still related. Also, the AJC is reporting that a group of the former president's supporters copied a trove of sensitive Georgia election files in Coffee County. According to the AJC, Trump attorney Sidney Powell helped to coordinate the effort that included data from an election server voter checking computers, and ballot memory cards. Darren, I just want to go to you first because it doesn't sound good. The GBI has opened a criminal investigation. Yeah, I mean, this is like really sort of compounding on a lot of things on both sides, right? I mean, Democrats, we're all for making sure that election security is there and, and try to eliminate scrutiny. But now you got the GBI involved, and clearly this is another sort of bad story to Janelle's point, where I think that Republicans are going to have to defend or defend the people who were supporting them and what they were trying to do as far as overturning democracy. And so I will be very interested to see when this GBI report will come out, uh, how will it affect the election, but ultimately, the Secretary of State's office and these local county elections have got to continue to work together to make sure that when claims come up like this, we can identify them early uh, and, and, and take, don't take, take care of them. But what I'm really interested in, Lori, is that here we are in August of 2022. This happened allegedly, what, last in 2020 or 2000, yeah, 2020. So two years later, is leading up to another monumental um, you know, election. Why is it taking so long for us to uncover this information? And Phil, why Coffee County? Well, I don't know. I think that, uh, as we're pointing out here, all of the counties in Georgia control the elections in that county. I don't know why they didn't get uh, advice from the Secretary of State's office or from their attorneys as to, can we do this? Can we turn this over to an attorney? Uh, even in Fulton County, just in uh, last July 28th, in an, in an email from Ryan Germany, the Secretary of State's attorney, he said, oh, we did find in 2020 there were some errors and, and misinformation and mismanagement. Well, to Theron's point, why are we still finding this out now in August of 2022? We've really got to have some reforms here. Melita, final word. Well, I think it's Coffee County is in southeast Georgia. 
and it's a very rural, very red county, and I would imagine that the Trump attorneys, Sidney Powell, were very um, clever in, in cultivating and setting up their little operation. All right, we'll leave it there, everybody. Coming up, Democrat Stacey Abrams says she needs the overwhelming support of African-American men in order to win in November. Polls show she's underperforming in that demographic. We'll discuss. Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. Democratic gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams says she needs the overwhelming support of African-American men in order to put her over the finish line come November. Theron, can she get there, and what's the issue here? What's interesting is that during the break, Phil just reminded me, <laughs> I did say two weeks ago, the brothers will come home, <laughs> and I believe that ultimately black men are going to do what we usually do, and that is vote majority of the time, 80-plus percent for the Democratic candidate. But look, Lori, Stacey Abrams is doing the exact thing she's supposed to be doing, right? We all know this on the panel. You've got to put together a winning coalition to win elections. She's also doing the same thing by talking about a specific demographic, the same thing that Brian Kemp is doing. Brian Kemp is going to rural areas, North Georgia, South Georgia, and saying, hey, Trump supporters, don't stay at home this time. I need you to turn out. So what she's saying is, is that in order for her to build this winning coalition, black men and other demographics play a very, very important role in that. Now, I do believe that, look, if everyone who's registered to vote, we know there was roughly 900,000 plus African Americans who were registered to vote that did not vote in 2020 and did not vote in 2021. I believe that her campaign is focusing on those demographics and she's also trying to win the middle. She's trying to hold on to the Latino vote and she's trying to do better with white independent men. But ultimately, I've heard two reactions from this, I'll be honest. I've heard some black men come to me and say, hey, you know what, why are we sort of being put in a position to be sort of the escape goat if she doesn't win? But I've also heard the, the, what you know, the majority of people are saying is that, you know what, she's right. We need to do more. We need to actually make sure we show up. We need to make sure we're registered and we got to show up and basically match the African-American women vote that has really been the backbone of the Democratic Party for so long. And Janelle, what about this rallying cry? Could it mm -hmm. help Stacey Abrams really <laughs> say to the African-American males, like, hey, I need you? You know what? I, I think that black men are tired of doing what they usually do. I think that they are looking to do something different. And I say that as I spoke to my black man that's in my house, Kelvin, and <laughs> about this very topic. And he was saying how when he was traveling the state, he was talking to men and he, it, the, the concerns that he heard was that, w number one, at the time, they were really concerned about having to choose between COVID restrictions in their jobs, which to take care of their families. <laughs> they were really concerned about um, the um, not having enough economic opportunities. They were really concerned about the fact that they don't want to have men in the bathroom with their daughters. And these are topics that are coming from the right that are that we are tackling, where it seems like the left is wanting them to acquiesce to whatever that is. Not to mention that Black Lives Matter removed the patri patriarchal figure out of the home and said that you're irrelevant, we don't need you. So now I look at it and I say that, you know, to, to, there's, a, there's this conversation around black women feeling unprotected. I think black men are feeling disrespected. And I think they're feeling disrespected primarily from black women. And that's a conversation I think we need to have as well. Alita. I think that Stacey Abrams has a big challenge to answer some of these concerns as outlined by Janelle. I think she has a strong team to help her do so. And I believe in reaching out, she creates awareness of the fact she does need black male votes. And frankly, misogyny is, is something that happens across all cultural and racial barriers. There are some men who just will not vote for a woman, no matter what she's running for. And that's misogyny. Go ahead, Theron. Theron. Yeah, but let me, let me, let me <laughs> say this. All right, so here's the thing, right? Like any demographic, you've got to spend time with them, and that's what Stacey's doing. You got to make sure that she remains authentic. She got to basically continue to meet with them. And I'm hearing, look, and Melita, you're hearing the same things. Her campaign is laser-like focused on building this coalition, and black men, quite frankly, for the first time, is really getting the, the attention that they really deserve for a gubernatorial candidate. The other factor that we have here is that, look, we have Herschel Walker on the ballot. You got Reverend Raphael Warnock. You got Fitz Johnson, if, if the election is in November for the PSC. And then you have Stacey Abrams. And you also have William Bodie, who's a labor commissioner candidate on the Democratic side. So I think both campaigns, the Kemp campaign and the Abrams campaign, are trying to figure out how do 
black men fit into your voter turnout model. And I think what Stacey Abrams is doing very smartly in, in August is saying, all right, I need you, but now let me bring you in. And to Melita's point, she's got to answer these questions. I mean, look, as much as I disagree with Janelle on a lot of stuff, I disagree with the majority <laughs> of stuff she said, but I do think that you do have a small demographic of black men out there that want to hear more from the Democratic Party, and I think that she's doing that. Phil, over to you. Well, I think it's just, uh, desperation by Stacey Abrams when she's trying to say, look, you know, you're, you're going to be a problem if I don't win. And I think to call them misogynistic, you know, is outrageous. Uh, I think, to Janelle's point, I think, uh, you know, people are making up their minds. I think the economy is a big issue here. It's the economy stupid. We've heard that in politics. Uh, Trump won 15 percent of the African-American vote in the state in 2020. And a lot of that were black males who were tired of some of the things that Janelle has pointed out. So I, I think that uh, there's a real problem. After all, it's Stacy's playing catch up. You know, she has been in California for the past three years and just came back to Georgia. She's still got a house in Hollywood, but uh, she's catching up trying to get some votes. She's been a Georgia. All right, let me go to another issue because this week Governor Brian Kemp announced he's giving out cash payments totaling $1 billion, that's billion, to some of the state's most vulnerable residents. Now, this money comes from the COVID relief package, Melita. Well, it's very interesting that he's having so much fun giving out this money that came from a democratically controlled Congress and a package that he criticized at the time it passed. True. So, um, but he's still refusing to expand Medicaid. He's still um, trying not to do some of the things which with this money would be a longer term benefit to those who need it. Well, it's not like he's gonna give the money back, right? It's right, there. Right. But I also wanna say Music Midtown may have been canceled, right? But a huge win for Georgia, the college football playoff title game will return in 2025. And, and mm -hmm. Governor Kemp was touting that as well. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a fan of baseball. So, I mean, congratulations on bringing the, college football. the college, college football <laughs> team here. But I'm a, I'm a baseball fan. Um, but I, I do wanna say Are something really quick. Are you a football fan or a baseball fan? I'm a baseball fan. Okay. So, I, I mean, but I am congratulations okay. to bringing the football team here. The football <laughs> national championship here. I will. <laughs> that was a question for Thayer. But um, I, <laughs> I, w I do want. I do want to say something a little bit about the cash, if, if you don't mind. Um, you know, when it comes to this, you know, we got to remember this was a leftover balance from the American Rescue Plan. So what he's saying is that I want to give it to people who deserve it the most. And when we look at what's happening in the economy, this is actually a win. Let's not forget that Stacey Abrams touted passing out money and paying off, you know, medical debt to people throughout the state um, prior to her announcement she's going to run for governor. So I, I don't think we can come down too hard on Governor Kent. I think the only difference there is, is that to Melita's point is that look you got to be very careful what you say when things happen, right? Like we learned that you better be careful when Trump calls you and say, hey, I need 11,000 plus votes. I think in this case, when Joe Biden says, hey, I'm going to give all this money to the state of Georgia, Governor Kemp did have some very critical things to say. And the difference is between what Governor Kemp is doing and what Stacey Abrams did is that she raised that money. This was money, I think, that was out of her campaign and other words, and she gave that money out before she decided to run for governor, a little bit while she's running for governor too. So you're dealing with government money that came from a, I believe, a, a, a president is getting a little bit more popular. Gas prices are going down. No, no. Jobs you are a long way to go. And, and it versus, yeah, let, let me it's take going you to down. a gas station. Okay, wait, I gotta end it there because we gotta get to the next block. It's going down. Y'all can discuss during the commercial break. Coming up, the Atlanta-based CDC announces a major reorganization after its leader admits the organization fell short in many ways during the pandemic. Thank you. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Director Rochelle Walensky said Wednesday that the agency did not reliably meet expectations and must do better after an external review found shortcomings in the COVID-19 response. And Phil, Melita, the gang, we've talked about this time and time again. I'm glad that she is recognizing the shortcomings. We saw them, we observed them, we discussed them, but Phil, just your thoughts on this. Well, just last week I made her and the CDC the loser because I pointed out that politics was far too much on the uh, prime agenda than health care. And I, I would say that about the last administration, too, as well as the Biden administration. I think she should be fired. I mean, all the things she just admitted that they're having to correct, it was kind of window dressing for the most part. It needs a total reorganization. And Melita, a lot of this came down to communication. It did, and you all talk about the, the quality of communications a lot mm -hmm. and, and how important that is for getting out a message. She's really only been on the job about a year and a half, and so I think for her to do a reset rather than being fired is, is the proper 
thing because she really did outline a lot of bullet points of, of things she's going to correct. And I think the most important thing is that she's talking about eliminating some of the layers of the bureaucracy and speeding up responses. And those certainly have are needed and the need for them has been demonstrated with the most recent two health operations you right. know, uh, around pandemics. We'll bring it down to a more local level now. Under some objections from its own council members, Sandy Springs gave the okay to move forward to help build a Holocaust Memorial Center. Center. Critics, including Councilman Tibby DiGiulio, said the $6 million project does not make sense right now. Janelle, to you. Yeah, so this is something that I um, worked with Chuck Burke on. Um, I, I sent a letter to the city council when they first went before them. I, I spoke virtually at the last city council meeting in support of this. And the reason why I support it is because it's not just a museum. It's an interactive experience that helps people to understand what led up to the war, what led up to the Holocaust. And that's extremely important no matter what your ethnicity is. We need to know what to look for when things are happening. Um, and I think it also allows for, it allows you to use all of your five senses to understand what happened and, it, and to me that's always a good educational moment. All right. Well it's been a long time coming but the city of Atlanta has finally settled with the owners of three homes in the Peoplestown neighborhood. The homes are in an area that floods. The city will now move forward with a sewer infrastructure project. Therein, I don't I, I, these people are obviously very deserving of this, but yeah. I think a lot of folks were like, wait, the price tag? I mean, close to $2 million for each of these homeowners. Well, you know, we got to give Mayor Dickens and the council mm -hmm. members uh, who've been focusing on this for a while. I mean, this has um, preceded Mayor Dickens. This is something that the Bottoms administration, I think even the Reed, the Reed administration, yes. uh, was dealing with as well. And so while I think he also deserves credit for the college football championship coming here in 2025, <laughs> not to give all the governor credit, uh, but he played a role in that. But, you know, this is something that's very near and deep to the mayor uh, in his heart and his administration. I mean, they made this a priority. You know, I, you know, I talk about people's down, but I also talk about Forest Cove. And what you see from this mayor, Lori, is a level of compassion and, quite frankly, not just resting on campaign promises, but dealing with the issue where people literally have been living in horrible and deplorable conditions. I mean, the flooding you just showed in your packet was just unbelievable to watch. Now, the price tag may be a little high, but ultimately, this is something that the city has been working on for a very, very long time and it took this mayor, Mayor Dickens, to get it done with the help of a lot of others. Well, and I think the price tag may have gone up because the residents felt so disrespected, particularly by former Mayor Reed, <laughs> and they felt disrespected during the Bottoms administration. And so by coming in um, and, and showing them respect, he was able to solve the problem, get the deal done, and yes, the price tag may be high, but that's sometimes what you have to do when people have felt so wrong. And I this think issue, that's the right answer. It is because I think this, that is the right answer. This issue came up during the candidate forum, and these people spoke so passionately about what they had been through, and I think people listened, Phil. Right, I, I agree with that. They were ignored, and now this is the right thing. A right, a, 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 a wrong has been righted. Well, and one person in the community said she hoped their example would inspire others to speak up for themselves. Amen. You can fight City Hall. <laughs> <laughs> All right, coming up, winners and losers. Stay tuned. Time now for the week's winners and losers. A big winner this week, former First Lady Rosalind Carter, who turned 95. Wow. A big happy birthday to her. Melita. My winner is the longtime um, first woman to serve as the Georgia Secretary of State and a good friend of mine, Kathy Cox. She's having her official installation as president of Georgia State College and University on Friday with all the attendant um, pomp and circumstance in Milledgeville. And um, then my loser is Charlie Hazlett has pointed out in his Trouble in God's Country blog that 123 Georgia counties report more deaths than births in 2021. And that's a figure about quality of life that we need to pay attention to. Phil. That is a shocker. Is. You know, uh, my winner, Theron, is the almost empty jail. Now we'll have now 700 inmates <laughs> in, in Atlanta. Um, the Fulton County Commission, Sheriff Labad, and Mayor Dickens, I'll give him uh, credit. I'm going to give credit to uh, Michael Julian Bond and the whole city council. We're finally <laughs> going to get this resolved. It's been 30 years that we've had this overcrowding at the Fulton Jail, so that's good. New GBI Director Mike Register, a great, <coughs> a great pick by the governor. 
Theron, can you tell these two, we really missed you. I can tell. <laughs> I think Phil waited for me to get back to say that. That's right. Well, you know, I, I got one for you, Phil. You know, a lot of times we talk about Democrats, you know, defunding the police, which is not true. You got the Cab County CEO who basically did something really big this week uh, for police officers and firefighters, gave them a significant raise where they're now the highest paid police officers and firefighters. And also, I encourage a lot of our viewers to watch the documentary called Bowlegs. Uh, Marvin Arrington Sr. I watched it on the plane recently. Tremendous film about Atlanta. A lot I didn't know, but shout out to Marvin Arrington Jr. and Lynn Vaughn who produced it. And then lastly, go Gladiators. We beat Cedar Shows uh, this <laughs> week, 40 to zero. So I'm very happy that my Gladiators on track. All right, Janelle. All right, well, I want to, well, for one, all of us are winners for being kind to everyone on the show. That's true. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, I, so Kelvin and I are speaking at an event um, this Tuesday. It's, gonna, it's the Frontline Conservative Business Alliance. It's on August 23rd. You can go to frontlinepolicy.com slash August Luncheon. We're going to be talking about business and um, how we're kind of navigating that. Um, and congratulations to Burt Jones, who's running for lieutenant governor, who hosted a successful Women for Bird event this past week. And then shout out to Anita and Dwayne, who are fans of the show. I met them at the Braves game, and uh, Anita has some good political instincts. So... So, good, good for them. And it appears you are a baseball fan. <laughs> I am a baseball fan. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. See you again next week.